we've been focusing on uh, windows of illustrations, trying to bring in biblical and extra-biblical illustrations that focus on some aspect of truth as the Bible reveals it. And um, several weeks ago, our topic was uh, the nature of man. The doctrine of man is pivotal in all world forces, in world religions, in uh, political, uh, powerful um, um, organizations. The doctrine of man is very pivotal. It's extremely important. Now, the Christian teaching concerning the doctrine of man is not the same thing as other groups teach about man. And so our kickoff sermon emphasized that man is, number one, a, a created being. He's not merely a, an evolved uh, accidental formation of the flukes of nature. He's created by God. Man is a created being. It means that he has purpose. And God has a plan and a purpose for his life. Man, the second point is man is a fallen being. That is, that sin came. And God's original purpose for man uh, became flawed, became damaged, because man fell in sin. And then the third aspect of man is that man is accountable to God for his sin. And this is just looking at man. Now, we didn't talk about the doctrine of God and the redemption and so forth. That's going to come at a later time. Of course, we brought in something about that. Then we came back the following week, and we dealt with point one. Well, it was two weeks later because we had our missionary uh, Sunday night service or the song service. But anyway, the next time we dealt with it, we focused on point one of that sermon. Sermon, we enlarged upon it. That is... Uh, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is, is thy works, are thy works in all the earth. And it talks about man, how that he was made a little lower than the angel. And the glory of created man. And um, then tonight we're going to elaborate on point two of my original sermon. And that is that man is a fallen creature. And that's what we're going to be dealing with in Genesis chapter 3. I'm not going to take Genesis chapter 3 verse by verse, but I would like for us to read some of these verses together because I want to tell you what, no matter what angle in, in which you view life, no matter what uh, aspect of your life, your interests, or anything that you have about life, I don't think that you can find any more basic information and instruction than you can find in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And those who speak paternalistically about Genesis 1 through 3 as being a myth, and I realize that's a theological term, but to me oftentimes it's dealt with paternalistically, even by those that claim to believe the myth. I want to tell you what. Nothing is truer about human nature, about life, and the sooner people get grounded in Genesis 1 through 3. The more peace they're going to have in their lives, in their home, on their job, in society, and everywhere else. Because here you have the key to life. And so we're going to start reading tonight in uh, chapter 3 and read about uh, 10 verses or so. And if you will, please stand as we honor God's precious word. And you just follow along. Since I'm, I haven't decided what verse I'm going to stop at, so I'll not ask you to read aloud with me tonight, but just follow it along in your Bibles. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now I'm going to do something unusual and just, just give a little interpretation as we go along. Do you see... Uh, his implication, first he begins with a question. This is often and typical of the way that Satan tempts. He raises a question, you see. Uh, 
God said it, and she had heard him, and uh, so forth. But Satan begins with a question. Then his implication is clear. Why did God say this? You mean this great God that made you is keeping something from you, you see? Satan is indeed subtle. Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now the woman was on uh, shaky ground because she didn't quote God correctly. God did not say not to touch it. And he did not say lest ye die. He said ye shall surely die. So it's best to get it like God said it, you see. Uh, for God doth know that in that day that ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and, that, uh, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And you know that's the most amazing thing happened. Nothing happened. And I think sometimes our church members that violate God's laws and they get violent. They think. They drink and end. the world doesn't come to an end. They carouse. They cheat. They do things that Christians ought not to. And lo and behold, the world keeps right on going and they say, ha <laughs> ha. That preacher was all messed up. He didn't know that and so on. You know, that, you know that's the way it is. Well, nothing seemed to happen. And verse 7, And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. Now, isn't it interesting? As far as I know, that man is the only one of God's creatures that wears clothes. And some of his creatures called mankind don't wear clothes. You know that. People say, oh, I'm not ashamed of my body. Oh, I'm proud of my body. They haven't come to grips with the fact that we're sons, you see. And um, not that we ought to be ashamed of our bodies, but even the sinner automatically knew that they need a co needed a covering, which was an inadequate covering. But God provided for that later. Now, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden and the Lord God called upon Adam uh, unto Adam and said unto him where art thou and he said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself Let's just stop right there since we're not doing, and please be seated, we're not doing an exposition of this chapter tonight, but simply focusing on man's fall and uh, some of the ramifications of the fall of man. Now, the fact of sin is considered by modern man to be at best an oversimplification of the plight of mankind. And I suppose, at worst, the archaic reflections of ignorant people who haven't learned uh, modern things. And yet, interestingly enough, so many of mankind's problems have not only not been solved, but in many ways they've become exacerbated by our own achievements, such as pollution, the ecological problems that we face, the uh, immoral revolution that has hit our world and our, particularly our nation. And while sin by these moderns is considered to be a non-entity because it is not referred to as sin, um, man has a problem and the Bible describes it as a sin problem. And this is point one, that man has a sin problem. And his problem is basically a God problem. 
because God made him and sin the word sin means to miss the mark and so when God made man he made him to shoot for a mark in life to have a goal to have an achievement and that God set that goal very clearly in simple terms and what the Lord said if you'll meet this goal everything you need is going to be you're going to have completeness and we'll have fellowship but since he was made like God, he was made with capacity to make moral choices. And man disobeyed God. When he did, he missed the mark. God said it over here. Man ended up shooting over here, you see. He sinned. He missed the mark, you see. He went contrary to his God. He wanted to be God himself in choosing his own way, but he was not equipped to be God. And so in the midst of his sin, then um, uh, it became his basic problem. All other problems have grown out of this. The problem of evil is a human problem. Uh, we think of natural evil. Um, tornadoes, hurricanes, awful earthquakes, fires, disease, and so forth. These are human problems. The con you, I do not see how anybody could conceive of evil apart from humanity. Could you conceive of evil taking place on Mars, any type of evil, with the, uh, all of the, the, the hot planet, all of the molten lava, all of the gases and everything? But there are no human beings so far as we know, so we cannot conceive of evil being there. You see, evil itself, the very concept of evil, is associated with humanity. And that grows out of sin, which is basically man's rebellion to what God said. Now, some people would say that we are foolish to emphasize sin and to talk about sin. I heard about one pastor that was approached by some of the members of the church, and they said, Pastor, do not talk about sin. You're talking about sin. And the more you talk about sin, the more our members will more likely sin. Our children are going to become more sinners the way you talk about sin. Call it a mistake if you want, but don't be preaching about sin anymore. Now, can you imagine members with that kind of gall? But the pastor looked in his medicine chest that he had in his study, and there was a, there was a bottle of poison in his study. It was marked clearly marked strychnine. It had the skull and the crossbones on the label. Now, the pastor said, do you see what that bottle is? And one of the members of the delegation said, yes bottle of poison. Now he said, suppose I take that label of strychnine off of that bottle of poison and I put on there the label, say, essence of peppermint. He said, don't you see what happened? The milder you make the label, the more dangerous you make the poison. So we need to get back to where we recognize that man, though created in God's image, has a sin problem. And this is an awful problem. It is the source of every other problem that he has. You see? It grows out of that. Now, I realize that a lot of times we very flippantly say, well, the devil made me do it, or we blame it because we're a sinner and so forth. I'm not looking for excuses tonight. I'm looking for reasons that give us a tool to deal with what God wants us to deal with. Because the whole human race is victimized because of our sin problem. Our biggest problem is not sins, but sin. There is a difference. Sin is the disease. Sins are manifestations of this disease. Now, you can get somebody to quit sinning, but if you don't take care of the sin problem... The basic disease is still within that soul, you see. Sin is an awful thing. I heard of one day a, a beautiful eagle flying up in the air, and the person watching it was amazed at the wingspan and the grace and the strength of this mighty eagle. But then he noticed something. The eagle began to flutter high in the sky, and he couldn't understand it. And all of a sudden, the eagle came tumbling down and crashed on the ground. And he went over and examined that eagle, and the eagle was dead. And he commenced to look and try to figure out why did this majestic eagle die. And then he noticed underneath the belly of this eagle 
was a weasel. The eagle had swooped down and grabbed the weasel up, and in the process, this weasel had dug its claws into this eagle's belly, and little by little, the blood of that eagle had dripped out until the eagle died. And sin is an awful disease like that. Oftentimes it begins very gradually uh, in our own eyes. Uh, a little child doesn't seem like much of a sinner. What evil can a little child do? But even little children have the disease of sin. And uh, it's something that we need to take extremely seriously. And if, uh, if Dan Rather and uh, the other newscasters don't talk about sin because that's a theological concept. We need to get to where in our Christian lives we think along these lines and we are not ashamed that we do recognize that man does have a sociological problem. He does have an anthropological problem. He does have a physiological problem, medical problem, uh, political problems and so forth. But his basic problem is his relationship to God. His relationship to God affects his relationship to man more than anything else. You can doctor up man's relationship to man politically, but you will not solve his problem by passing more laws for this and more laws for that. If the passing of laws could solve our nation's problems, we'd be perfect long time ago. I wonder how many, many, many thousands of laws have been passed and our nation is ridden through with crime and corruption. Why? Because man is a sinner. Man has a sin problem. Listen, you have a sin problem. You and I have a sin problem. And that brings me to point number two. We need to call it sin. You see? We need not to make excuses and call it something else. I remember one girl in our church some, some years ago, uh, she came and very brazenly she said, you're trying to cause me to have a guilt trip. But no, I was hoping the Lord would help her to feel the guilt that she deserved. You know, it's easy to brush off God's convicting power by saying the preacher's trying to ha cause me to have a guilt trip. I'm not trying to cause anybody to have a guilt trip. But I'll tell you this, if they're guilty, they need to feel that sin is sin. Because the only way I know that you can really get rid of true guilt is to confess sin and then to trust God through His mercy to relieve you from that sin. A man was being attacked by a dog and he had a sword in his hand and he took his sword even though the dog belonged to um, a political leader. He took the sword and he cut the head of the dog off. He just hit it with that sword and just cut the dog's head off. Well, the politician was very, very angry. And he, told, he came and he told the man, he said, Why in the world didn't you hit that dog with the handle? He said, If that dog had attacked me with his tail, I would have hit it with the handle. But the dog attacked me with his head, so I hit it with the sword. Listen. We have got to deal with sin head on because the devil is not going to come in a mild way to do his evil to us. He's going to hit us with fury. He may come subtly, but he is furious from the start. So the sooner we hit the devil head on, the better off we're going to be in trying to counteract the devil's ways. Do you know that sin is the only thing that I know about in life that the more, the deeper you go into it, the less you know about it. Now, isn't that amazing? Anything else you go into, the deeper you go into it, the more you know about it. But now take Adam and Eve, for instance. When they went into sin, first they knew God, they knew the love of God, they knew the fellowship of God. Now they hid from God because they thought God was chasing them. God wasn't chasing them. He was the same God He was before. He was loving them. So, Immediately they misconstrued the kind of God that God was. Then they became anxious when God said, Adam, where are you? Adam hid himself. He put, they put fig leaves around themselves, which would not provide the covering which they needed. They needed to be relieved from their disobedience to God. But they thought fig leaves covering their bodies 
would keep the all-seeing eye of God. So they were totally messed up, you see. The one hope that they had, they ran from. They were anxious. They were struck with fear. Their entire lives were, were totally messed up because of sin. Now listen, man is a fallen sinner. He needs to call his sin, sin, and nothing else. A uh, little, a, a young boy, a flippant youth, uh, interrupted a preacher one day and uh, he said, you tell me about the burden of sin. He said, I don't even feel any burden of sin. What do you mean a burden for sin? The preacher said, well, for instance, if I were to take a 100-pound weight and place it on a corpse, would that corpse feel that weight on him? And the young man said, well, no, he wouldn't. He's dead. And the pastor said, when people are dead in sin, neither do they feel the burden of sin. Now, here's the thing. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life to enable us to feel the burden of sin. And when people have the Holy Spirit mercifully and graciously operating in our lives to point out sin, we need to rejoice in that fact because apart from the Spirit's work, we will feel no burden for sin. Now, I heard about um, a king who had... Uh, just hundreds and hundreds of prisoners in one of his prisons. And one day, he decided to let one of the prisoners out. And somebody said, why did you release that prisoner? He said, well, I went throughout the whole prison and asked these men, were they guilty of the crimes that they committed? And you know, every one of those men except that man said that they were not guilty. And he said he was guilty of the crime that he was charged of. But all of these others in prison said that they were innocent. So he said, I wanted to get that guilty man away from all these innocent people lest he pollute them. You see. Now, until we are grateful to God that His Holy Spirit comes to us saying, do not touch, do not cross this line, or do this, do thus, thus saith the Lord. Until we are receptive to that, then we're not in a position to call sin, sin. Because, listen, the milder you make the label, the more dangerous you make the poison. Then, also, we need to re recognize that Jesus is the only a hope of having our sin removed. Now, there are many remedies for sin that are offered by people who don't call sin, sin. The world has a remedy. It comes in various forms, but all of them are insufficient, inadequate. I believe that there isn't anything comparable to a personal relationship to Jesus Christ, the great physician, and that our job as a church is not so much to cause people to feel guilty, but listen, unless we are honest with sin in our own lives, we will never really know the wonderful uh, freedom from guilt and the capacity to cope with the tempter in an ongoing basis and to have a unity in our lives that God wants us to have, a peace with God that enables us to reach out and to be peacemakers with our spouse, and with our children and with our church family and with those outside of our church family. It is that reuniting with God through the work of Christ on the cross when he delivers us from the penalty of our sin through faith in Christ that all of the other graces come out. We begin with God or he begins with us and then we move out in our relationship to our fellow man. And this is the only way that it comes. Now, when we acknowledge that all of the problems that we have are traceable back to sin, S-I-N, not necessarily our own sins, but the fact we do share in the sinful race, that we need to call sin, sin, and not play around with it. But I want to tell you what, it is hard for me to call my sin, sin. 
it's a lot easier for me to call your sin sin. You see what I mean? But we need the grace to do that and recognize that it is a wonderful movement of the Holy Spirit to point out these sins. Not to make us guilty, because we're guilty anyway, but to take away the sin and the guilt and to free us so that we can cope with sins and the tempter as God wants us to. Uh, back in the days when surgery was performed without anesthesia, a great surgeon had the habit of telling those who would come to him for surgery. He would say, I want you to look real, real good at the sore that I'm fixing to do surgery on. And once you have thoroughly looked at that sore, then he said, while I do the surgery, I want you to look at me. And do not take your eyes off of me until I complete the surgery. Now, Jesus has taught us that we're sinners. The Word of God has taught us that we're sinners. We've got to realize that we are lost before we can ever have that divine surgery. Until a person is lost, he can never be saved. Why will he call for the lifeboat if he doesn't realize his peril and his jeopardy? And then once we are saved by looking to Jesus, then we keep looking to him who has saved us and who has redeemed us and who is our hope of heaven. You know, I heard of a, of a young man dying on the battlefield. And uh, people went to assist him as he was dying. And they heard him say, Here. And they started ministering to his needs. And they asked him if his hand was up what he was doing he said hush he said they're calling the roll of heaven and they just call my name so through the grace of Christ though we're sinners we're objects of God's love and the only remedy for our sin is Jesus and just as they made fig leaves in their own efforts they were inadequate the fact is that shortly thereafter God made them coverings of skin and to make coverings of skin for the naked bodies Animals had to be shed and their blood had to be spilled. And that was a picture of the hope that they would have that Christ would come and would make salvation possible. Uh, did they know about Jesus? In some way they did, just as Abraham did. And Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced and was glad, you see. And we don't understand it, but we know that God in his mercy has always pointed lost sinners Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Tonight, if there is one person here who never yet has had your sin removed, will you come to Jesus? He said, Him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And if there are any other decisions that you have to make, you come as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation.